Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this hybrid seminar for the uh, staff here at the LMB um, and also for an online audience as part of Cambridge Biomedical Campus Virtual Tours. Um, before we begin, just a little technical detail. So at the end of this session, we always have questions. Obviously, for you guys, that will be as normal. We will have a microphone. But for our online audience, please can you uh, write your questions into the chat and then these will be read out by one of our team uh, so that the audience here can hear them as well. So to start a few words about the LMB, the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology or LMB is a world leading research institute dedicated to understanding important biological processes at the levels of atoms, molecules, cells and organisms. We aim to study difficult long term problems and in doing so contribute knowledge needed to solve key issues in human health. We seek to understand the structures of molecules and molecular structures, their fates and functions within cells, and how these molecules and machines uh, work together to make up complex systems such as tissues and organs. The LMB's origins date back to 1947, when a unit was first established to study protein structure. Over the years, LMB scientists have made many revolutionary contributions to medicine, both in terms of new understandings and in the development of new technology. Today, we also celebrate Fish in Research Week here at the LMB, and I'm delighted to welcome Professor Lalita Ramakrishnan to give our talk today. Lalita is head of the University of Cambridge's Molecular Immunity Unit, which is located within the LMB. She's a group leader in the LMB Cell Biology Division and also works as an infectious disease consultant at Cambridge University Hospital. After completing her medical training in India, Lalita completed a PhD, medical residency and postdoctoral research in the US. In 2001, she joined the faculty at the University of Washington, where she pioneered the zebrafish as a model for tuberculosis before moving to Cambridge in 2014. Lalita is a member of the US National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the Royal Society, the Academy of Medical Sciences, and the American Academy of Microbiology. In this talk, Lalita will share with us how her research using zebrafish has proven immensely powerful for understanding the pathology of human tuberculosis, and how her team have translated this work into potential new treatments for disease. So the title today of, talk, of today's talk, Lessons from Tuberculosis Treatment Using the Zebrafish. So thank you very much, Lalita. Thank you for inviting me to give this talk. And wow, what an audience. I don't think these many people come to my scientific seminars. So I think I'm just going to do non-scientific seminars from now on or science seminars for non-scientists. So before I get started, I want to just say that, you know, of course, you've just told us how great the LMB is and the science here, but I've worked at many institutions, many prominent institutions, and I have to say, I have never worked in a friendlier place with regard to the non-scientific staff or the scientific support staff. And, you know, it's like from the minute you, you know, from when you walk in and you see, you know, Lorraine and, you know, you, you, you then you go in and you're just friends with everybody and everybody. It's the most smoothly running place. And it's because of you guys. So um, it, I think. That's one of the main reasons I wouldn't want to leave here, not so much the scientific colleagues as the quote, non-scientific colleagues. So I'm of course a little intimidated by being here. My, all three of my bosses are here. Anne Graham is here. And um, uh, I said, I think I saw Nicola in there. And, you know, so it's, uh, it's, it's well, you know, we'll see. <laughs> okay, so um, what what I've got, what I want to share with you today is how we've used this weird and unique model organism, the zebrafish, uh, to try to figure out some some uh, aspects of TB that were puzzling before, and um, and what the benefits of this model organism have been, and how they fit into the structure of studying TB in general. So um, I want to remind you that, you know, we're in the, we've, we're just coming off and we haven't even come off really a, a pandemic with a respiratory 
virus that has you know, caused a lot of deaths. But I want to remind you that lurking behind this is another respiratory pathogen, and that is TB. And just like COVID, TB is spread through these aerosols. You know, you can, let me see if I can get this to work. Yeah, you see, if they breathe out these droplets and then they go into the lung of the next individual, COVID often settles here. So you get uh, more of a, a upper in infection occasionally going into the lung. TB almost always first goes down into the lung. And, but TB is an ancient, ancient disease. It's been there, COVID, it's in, as opposed to COVID, which is one of our most modern diseases. TB has been around for something like, oh, depending on who you ask, between 30,000 and 10,000 years. So it's really figured out how to live with us and how to cause disease. And uh, this is the spine of a mummy that almost certainly had TB as judged by how uh, it's deformed because unlike because TB can also infect other organs other than the lung. And actually, when I was a kid, my mother had spinal TB and had to be on bed rest and have three surgeries. So we'll get back to that in a minute. So I'm quite familiar with this. Now, because TB, partly because TB is so ancient and partly because the bug that causes TB is so clever, TB is the humanity's greatest killer. It is estimated to have killed 1 billion people to date. And I, I really like this graph because this graphic, because it shows you, you know, when we think of great killers of humanity, we think smallpox and plague, right? We know about the Black Death and so on. But look at the contribution of TB versus these other terrible diseases like smallpox and plague. You can see how TB dwarfs it. And if you want to look at what COVID has done, I'm not trying to diminish COVID. It's a very important pathogen, but because it's so new, it's only managed to kill these many. And hopefully it's going to end there and not, not, be the, not, not rise to the proportions of TB. Okay, so TB is ancient, but the sad thing is that it's still very present. We don't see it so much where we live, but you can see that much of the world, just look at this upper graph first, you can see that much of the world, look Asia, much of Africa, South America, and even parts of Europe like Russia are, uh, are really um, affected, afflicted by TB to this day. And, and TB kills about, uh, sickens about 10 million people a year and kills about one and a half million people a year. It was the number one killer until COVID came when it was surpassed by COVID. And it is predicted that it will be the number one killer again, maybe by next year, uh, which is a pretty sad state of affairs. T the other problem with TB is that it's got drug resistance so that now we've got about half a million cases of drug resistance every year, which makes it even more difficult to treat. And if you look at that map, it's a little more sobering because look where there's a ton of drug resistance quite close to us, Russia, Russia, Ukraine, and these, these areas are going to be, the TB is predicted to be worsened in these areas by the conflict uh, that's happening. So what do we think, when we think about TB, I mean, you're all going to, many of you have actually talked to me, you know, once you knew I was giving this talk and have told me, about relatives, you know, older relatives, gener one generation before you who've had TB, some of whom have even died of TB. And so I think it's not that unfamiliar. So what do we think of when we see someone with TB? We, see, we think of someone who looks like this because what was TB called? It was called consumption. And they're usually coughing up and they're often coughing up blood. And um, when, when you look at their lungs, there's, a, a big lesion that's over there and they can it can be worse and you know one time we were watching some Jane Austen thing on Mas Masterpiece Theater and there was this woman who was dying in a poor house and her friend comes to see her and she's coughing up blood and I said to I said you know they're they're dying uh, she's clearly dying of TB and my son turned to my daughter they were both little kids and he said have you 
notice that when anyone's dying on TV, mama always thinks that they're dying of TB? And I said, well, they are, you know, they are dying because, because you know, we, books, movies, uh, opera, all have highlighted deaths with TB. Why? Because they were so common. Okay, so this brings me to, to, uh, to this, to give you some actual facts that when TB was discovered by a guy, a brilliant microbiologist, a doctor turned microbiologist in, in 1881, TB was responsible for one seventh of Europe's deaths. And that included one third of people in the ages of 25 to 40, the working age. Could, can you imagine one third of people who were at the peak of their productivity were dying of this one single infection? And, and that is why it, is, it was so prominent. It was called, you'll, have, you'll know that in books, it's called the white plague. It's called captain of all these men of death. Um, that's a John Bunyan book. And of course, consumption is what it was mostly called. Okay, so why, what, why is TB still here, uh, even though we have antibiotics for it? Well, and a vaccine for it. So there's a BCG vaccine that was found, discovered in 1921. We're going to come back to that. But the problem with the BCG vaccine is that mysteriously, it does help protect very young kids from very severe forms of TB like meningeal TB, brain TB. But then those same kids are not protected later in life and they get TB just the same. So we use it in countries where there's a lot of TB, but it doesn't help to squash the, the, the global burden. The other problem is that yes, there are antibiotics, but antibiotics take a long time to, to cure. You need to use multiple antibiotics for many months, and we'll get to that in a minute. And part of the reason for this is that TB is a very complicated disease. The bug is doing lots of things inside us that make us make it difficult for us and our immune system to thwart it. So let me just give, let's just do a quick primer. You, it's coughed up by the infected individual, by the diseased individual, and now it gets into this new individual. Now in our cell, in our body, are cells called macrophages. And macrophages are the primary defenders of, of infection along with another cell type called neutrophils. But in our case, we're going to discuss macrophages. Macrophages can move to, to sites of it, where bacteria enter or viruses enter, eat them and kill them. And so what TB has done is to learn to live in these cells. So it's learned not to be killed by the macrophages. And then it actually forms these structures called tubercles or granulomas, which is the hallmark structure, which is a structure made of lots of macrophages because the host is bringing in more and more macrophages to try to kill the bugs. The bug is saying, I don't care and it's managing to live within them. And it's even reveling in the fact that more macrophages are coming in because it can build a bigger house. And then the next thing that happens is that mysteriously, these granulomas, the macrophages pop or die. They pop open by a death called necrosis. And now the bacteria live in the middle of the granuloma in this sort of cheesy mess that's called the caseum, which is just the Latin word for cheese. And, and this, this, in this mess, the bacteria can grow even better than they grew at this earlier step within the macrophages. And it is this step that then allows the bugs to be transmitted to the new person by breaking open in through these trachea that line the lung, and that, that sort of feed the lung and, and get coughed up. Okay, so that's, that's how TB does its business. So, oh, oh, oh. What is happening now? Oops. Ooh. Join LMB guest. See? Okay, good. Okay, so now I want to tell you about how we went about studying TB in a very, what was then thought to be a really weird way. So what everyone else was doing was they were taking the TB bug that infects us 
And it's a pretty specific bug. It's a bug that pretty much only infects humans. So any host you put it in is an artificial host. It never causes exactly the same disease. So people were studying TB in mice, rabbits, guinea pigs, and even in monkeys or non-human primates. And what we decided to do was to take a bug that was not TB itself, but closely related to TB. It's called Mycobacterium marinum. Mycobacterium marinum is well known to, to clinicians because in humans, it causes um, a, uh, a, a superficial disease that looks just like TB, but it doesn't spread. And even the bugs look like TB. This would be pretty much indistinguishable from TB bacteria, except they turn yellow when exposed to light and TB, the TB bacteria don't. Okay, now, however, this same bug, Mycobacterium marinum, actually causes disease in fish as well. It was first discovered in the Philadelphia Aquarium where fish were dying. And it was these, these fish that were dying that looked like these, these beautiful fish. And they couldn't figure out what they were dying of. But when they looked at them with pathology, they could see that they clearly had TB because they had those same tubercles. They had the same bacteria in the tubercles when they use special stains. And then they figured out that they were dying from, that these bacteria could only grow at a low temperature and not at a high temperature because they were fish bacteria. And the fish have a lower body temperature than we do. They're called ectotherms. And so this bacterium had adapted to a low temperature. And once they knew that, they could grow it at the low temperature. And now they could find that yes, this bacterium looks a bit like TB. And then many years later, we had a genome sequenced right here at the Sanger. And in fact, it looks, it's very similar to TB in its sequence. So what we decided to do was to use this bug in a model host called the zebrafish. Now, why the zebrafish? The zebrafish is a, is a pet host of developmental biologists and a pet host, not the pet host. And the zebrafish, like all fish, get these tubercles that form when you infect them with Mycobacterium marinum, as we showed here. So this is just a human granuloma. You can't see the bugs. You can just see the cells. And look in the zebrafish granuloma. Look how similar it looks to the human one on the left. And you can see there's a few bugs where there are lots of cells. And this is the point I want to make, where the cells have died, undergone that popping open necrosis. Look how many bugs there are. They're growing like gangbusters. Okay. But the beautiful part of the fish is that they have a transparent larval phase. And that's why developmental biologists love to see them. They love to see how the heart develops. They can just watch everything live. They can pop this little guy under the microscope and they can watch every step. And we thought, well, can we watch every step of infection then by by analogy. So we made bacteria that were fluorescent and we put them in and look, we could see in a whole embryo like this, we could see the grand, the tubercles had formed, there they were. And these were made, these are the fluorescent bugs in tubercles. Then we went a little further. And what we did was we engineered these fish to have fluorescent macrophages. Remember I said, that's the key player. And we said, okay, now can we watch, see what the tubercle looks like? And lo and behold, it looks very similar to a human tubercle, tight, granulo, macro, tight macrophages, in which, which are green fluorescent because we've engineered them to be so. And we can see blue fluorescent bacteria because that's the bug, the color we've used to, uh, to infect the fish. So this was all very good for us. So I want to just remind people that um, I make the fish look very big in these, in these uh, slides, but they're actually tiny. They fit in the cravat of Lincoln. So you have to figure out ways to deal with them. And so what people in my lab have perfected to an art form is how to micro inject the bacteria into these little larvae at breakneck speed, 100 an hour uh, at any site, you know, many different sites. So here is one site that you'll see. So it's a glass pulled needle, a glass needle that we've hand pulled. There's, a, there's some dye in it so that you can watch it go in. There's a little suction here so that you can hold the larva. 
and now watch it go. Look at that. So that's one site. And then if you want to inject them directly into the bloodstream, there's a little vein right there. And now we use a hockey stick and you can see this go. We just do one more. Okay, but then it gets really cool. And you can see why, why we really love these creatures because the next thing you can do is because they're tiny, you can put them in 96 wells like this and you can just take the whole well and you can stick it under a microscope and you can quantify how, how much fluorescence there is. And you can actually you know, say, okay, this fish had a lot, this fish had little, et cetera. And this incredibly powerful because you know, imagine in 10 minutes, you've got, your, you've got your 96 fish, you know exactly what's happening with them. You can do this every day and you can follow infection in what we call real time. And this little innovation has been our ticket to understanding stuff. Okay, so I wanna to get to the question of the hurdles to TB. And the hurdle that we have chosen to tackle is, why do, what can we do about the fact that you need long-term treatment with multiple antibiotics? And we've identified two new approaches to improve this treatment. But first I want to remind you that there have been TB drugs coming along over the years and um, the currently used regimen is these four drugs, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, ethambutol, and rifampicin. And you can see that the current regimen was all discovered already you know, more than 60 years ago, and we're still using this regimen. Now, this, and, 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 and this is what we, this regimen requires six months of treatment. So we're treating for six months with this regimen and yet everyone is super excited or was about this because it was called short course because before these drugs, when you had to use streptomycin and PAS and cycloserine, you, you had to go for 18 months. And I know this because my mother first got those regimens and they, first of all, she had to take long treatment and they didn't work, she relapsed. And it was only when this regimen came along that she got cured. And, but the problem is six months with four drugs is too long. If it's, long it's too long for us, we couldn't do it. But imagine if you're living in a country that's poor, you're poor, you have you work for you 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 have daily wages. If you have to go to a clinic to get your next month's supply, you lose a day's wages. You have to go somewhere walking by bus. You can see how as soon as you start to feel better, you stop taking the drugs, and then typically people relapse if they don't take less. If they take less than six months, it's almost like cancer. Initially, with cancer chemotherapy, you do better, but they want you to still continue it for the remaining time because otherwise the cancer comes back. Okay, now why is it that this, why do you get this relapse? Why, why, why do you need long-term treatment? If you take these same bugs out of a person and put them in a dish and treat them, they get, they get killed in 24 hours, just like any other bugs. And yet in the person, they're taking six months. And a student of mine, Kristen Adams, figured out a cause for why this might be. And what she found was that when the bugs go into us, they become tolerant. This is a different, when we all, we all know about drug resistant. We know about MRSA, for example. The, the staphylococcus has become resistant to antibiotics. No amount of, it'll be resistant in us. If you pull it out and treat, look, look, it'll be resistant in outside as well. In this case, I, as I said, they are not resistant when they come out. They are tolerant. And wh why they are uh, is, is the mystery that Kristen Adams, who was in my lab, sought to solve. And what she found was really interesting. She found that these bugs have pumps. They literally, you know, just think of it as a pump and they're pumping out the antibiotics. So, you know, here's your pump, here's the antibiotic, the pump opens up like that, antibiotic goes out. And what she then found was that this pump was what was causing a form of tolerance. And importantly, she then found drugs that clog up these pumps. 
So between her and Alex Lake, who's a new student in my lab, they showed that commonly used drugs for other purposes, such as proton pump inhibitors, which we use for acid reflux and, um, and you know, gastritis, clog up the pumps. Similarly, a drug called verapamil, which is used for high blood pressure and migraine, clog up these pumps. And so we are now asking with, you know, people in clinicians in other places where there's TB are asking, would if we added these drugs into the standard antibiotic regimen, could we shorten the treatment if we could block this tolerance? And so, and I want to point out that Kristen also showed that the tolerance develops when the bugs go into macrophages. We don't know why, but the bugs, when they go in, they actually switch on these pumps that pump out the antibiotics. And that's the problem. And that is why the tolerance is inside of us and not outside. Because as soon as they come out, they turn off the pumps. So the pumps are doing something for the bug inside us. And one of the things they're doing is they're kicking out the antibody. So this is just another, just, I've just tried a few different graphics uh, to see whichever makes sense. So you can see when the bug goes into the macrophage, it turns on these pumps. Those are the red bugs are the ones that turn on the bugs pumps. Not all the bugs turn them on. So when you treat with just the antibiotic, you get rid of the, the guys that don't have the pumps, but you don't get rid of the ones with the pumps. Our idea is that if we could add that efflux pump inhibitor, your verapamil or your omiprazole, then maybe you would get all of them and you would get a nice empty, say, uh, clean macrophage like that. So this is a cute little cartoon that Kristen did. Uh, when she first published her work. And basically there's your bug and it's got the pump and you can see that you are, uh, that it's, it's, you know, pumping out the uh, antibiotic. But now if you block the pump, then there's no antibiotic being pumped and you, uh, the bug, the antibiotic can stay inside and do its killing. And she drew this little whim whimsical cartoon where she was trying to demonstrate that the fish have led to a short course chemotherapy, a truly short course chemotherapy for Mr. Human. She had Dr. Zebra fish prescribing for Mr. Human. Um, you got to allow these things when you've worked so many years. <laughs> okay, quick other second story, um, which is totally different. So I again want to remind you that there's a ton of TB and TB is humanity's bigger, biggest killer. But this is a good analogy to COVID. COVID has been you know, tragic for us. It has killed millions and millions. I mean, the same year I had a cousin in India die of COVID and her sister got drug resistant TB. Fortunately, she's alive. So, you know, it has ravaged uh, people's lives, COVID has. But, at, but the flip side of it is that most people with COVID do fine. Some, most people barely know they have COVID. Others get it and recover. They are sick for a couple of days and recover. So remember, so the deaths and disease from COVID are just a, the tip of the iceberg. Doesn't make it less important, but makes it important in terms of our understanding. Funny thing is that my colleagues and I realized from doing studies, looking at old papers, that the same holds true for TB. 90 to 95 percent of people who got infected with TB over the years, over the millennia, didn't get TB. They recovered. They cured themselves without any antibiotics. And so that breaks the question, just as in COVID, why do that remaining 10, 5 to 10 percent that represents the billion people over, over the millennia and 10 million people today, why do they, why are, what's, what's different about them? Why do they get TB? And I want to point to a, and it's, we clearly think it's because of host factors, but we don't understand these host factors. It's not like, it's not at all clear cut. Normal, I mean, my cousin is, a, if you go, she went to an immunologist, they wouldn't find anything in her, you know, because we don't, that's, that's the limit of our knowledge. Yet we know it's a host factor because of a tragic accident that happened um, in uh, 1929. So I told you how we have the BCG vaccine and it used to be given to everybody, to babies. A day after they were born, 
and a month after they were born. And back then it was given orally. Now it's given inject by injection. And back and it, all that BC, the BCG vaccine is what we call an attenuated strain of TB. Basically, people just passage the TB bacterium hundreds of times until they could test it in a guinea pig or rabbit and found it didn't make any, didn't give them disease because it had lost important genes along the way. We don't know exactly what, et cetera. Now we do, but that's another story. But we didn't know, but we do, did know it didn't cause disease. So then what people used to do was they would get these, the, each hospital would get the BCG and they would grow it up and then they would, in, they would give it to their newborns. This, in this hospital in Northern Germany, you know, on the Denmark border in Lübeck, a physician accidentally grew up the virulent TB strain instead of the avirulent strain. And 251 newborns got the virulent strain uh, by, you know, one, you know, one dose when they were born, one dose when they were one month old. And sadly, a third of them died of TB. This was, remember, no treatment. There were no antibiotics back then. But the, what was super interesting from this tragic natural experiment that occurred was that the remaining two thirds survived without antibiotics. And a third of them got disease, but recovered. Just like COVID, some of us get it and die. Some of us get it and get disease and live. And others don't even know we had disease. So a third died, a third got disease but survived, and a third didn't even manifest any disease, even though they clearly got the bug because a mill of this stuff was given to them. Okay, so we thought, all right, let's see if we can figure this out in the fish. So how, what, as in what was, what was different about those one third kids who got, who died? And what we did was we took zebra fish and we used a chemical and we made mutations in them. The chemical makes mutations in throughout the genome. We don't know what these mutations are. And what we, but what we simply do is we, we take, so we, mutag we mutagenize the male poor guy, and then we cross it to the female and we go down. And in, in the end, we have very, you know, multiple mutations uh, with diff each fish will have a different mutation. We don't know what it is, but what we simply do is to now take those different muta mutated fish and we add, we, we infect them with our bugs. And we ask the question, are there some fish there who are more susceptible to the disease? And when we did that, we being a postdoc of mine, David Tobin, what you can see very clearly is this is that normal fish, the wild type that wasn't mutated, and its sibling that had been mutated, you see how much more the infection is? This was a hyper susceptible fish. And he made, we found several like this. And then he was able to map these. What you have to go back and do is you have to go back and figure out where the mutation is, you know, where in the genome. So now you know the gene. And then you have to figure out, okay, but I know where the gene is, but why does this, why is this gene important? And that's what we've been studying you know, bit by bit by bit to try to get a full picture of, of what TB does. And what I'm going to tell you is what we, remember I had told you that this step is a very critically bad step, which allows the bugs to grow and allows the TB to transmit. Well, David found that this mutation affected this step as in it accelerated um, necrosis. So here is what the cellular granuloma looks like. I'm just reminding you, I've shown you this before. And what his mutant looked like was what you can see is that the macrophages are dying more than here. And how do you know that? See how the green is going down and the blue is going up because the macrophages are green and they're dying. So less green and the bugs are growing because they like being outside the macrophages. So more blue. And look a couple days later, it's a no-brainer to see all the macrophages in this, in this initial structure have died and the bugs are really growing like gangbusters. So he figured this out. Okay, but this is in our little eggs, right? Little zebrafish eggs. How, does, how can we convince anyone this has anything to do with 
human TB, with those kids that died, who died, you know, all those years ago. Um, and so I just want to remind you, which was obvious from the bone mummy and from my mummy, that TB affects multiple organs. It can pretty much affect any organ, even though the lung is the most, most prevalent, but about 40% of TB can be outside of the lung. And the most severe form is the brain. And so what we did was we had found our mutant and we had found how it works in the fish in, ex in exquisite detail through the work of many postdocs in the lab. And we now went to a cohort of people who had meningeal TB, which is this brain TB. And they, you know, what you can see is this gamish, this, this terrible inflammation at the base of the brain. And they tend to die at a rate of about 25 to 40%, even if they're fully treated. And what we were able to figure out was why they die and how can we stop this death because we were able to show that the mutant that we had identified in the fish was exactly relevant to this death in a kind of startling for us similarity between the fish eggs and the humans. So just to you know recap, we started off with our fish, which come from the Ganges or Ganga River in, the in, in, in India. And by the way, were discovered by a Britisher, um, many years ago, long story, which anyone, I'm happy to tell anyone, it's a cool story. Um, and then we go to Vietnam and we did that TB meningitis cohort and we showed that our gene was, 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 uh, was responsible for death there. And then we went to a cohort of another disease called leprosy, which is related to TB, but different. And we showed that the same gene uh, affected uh, leprosy in Nepal. So this was very pleasing to us. And I left, I just wanted to tell you that just like with our, you know, efflux pump story where we now we're collaborating with people over the world, the joy of working in a field like mine is that the human work gets done by clinicians, you know, all across the world. Like in this case, it was Vietnam and Nepal. And uh, it's, 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 it's very uh, humbling to see how hard it is to translate work and how hard these people have to uh, to work, it, it, I mean, we have it much easier in the lab and it's good to remember that. Okay, so I'm gonna close now and I'm going to remind you that we, in this last bit, in my second approach, using a zebrafish genetic screen, we identified human mutations that make the granuloma go necrotic or die faster and that leads to more bacterial growth. And I had told you that we had, because we found the exquisite details of how this happens, we were able to identify drugs that can stop it from happening. And again, these are drugs that are not directed against the bacteria, but they're directed against the macrophages and preventing them dying. So basically we're, we're preventing the bug from killing the macrophage by, by inhibiting something in the macrophage, not the bug. And we found a drug that is commonly used to treat diabetes called metformin. We found an antidepressant drug that's uh, the tricyclic antidepressants. They're also used for neuropathies and migraines. We found high blood pressure drugs that do this. And uh, once again, our friend Verapamil popped up. Remember it had been used, we had, I told you, how it's used to thwart the bacterial efflux pumps. And we showed that verapamil just by total chance came up again. And we identified that it also prevents these macrophages from going necrotic. So you can think of it as a twofer and this would therefore would be my favorite drug to use because we could try to prevent this and we could try to prevent the bugs from turning on these pumps that pump out the antibiotics. So I'm gonna close there but I just want to make a final plug for, um, for our little fish. Okay, thank you. Okay, wait, 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 nope. I'm supposed to do this. Thank you. All right, questions. Uh, 
Hey, Lalita, uh, nice talk. Um, Darren Egan from uh, Biological Services Group over at Aries. Um, two questions for you. I don't get out too often, so I'm going to ask two questions. Uh, first one's more technical and the second one's a bit more um, touchy-feely. Um, but the first one is, uh, when you were doing your, um, you showed that little video there of the fish being micro-injected. Micro -injected. Um, I noticed that the fish wasn't moving much. How do you get them to stay so still? Ah. And secondly, um, obviously your personal experience with TB in your family, How? what impact has that had on your family? Or oh, sorry, on your research? Yes, yes, yes. Very good. Um, both excellent questions. Uh, so how do we get them to stay still? We have to anesthetize them. So, you know, they're, they're swimming around in this little dish and then we, we put an, an, an anesthetic agent and they get still just for the time that we do the injection. And, um, and, the, and, and then, then, we, then, and then they're, they're back again and they don't, have, they don't suffer any consequences. Obviously we've had to test all that and ensure that. But that brings me to the really, uh, I, I was going to mention something else and I decided not to, but now I will. So remember after we inject them, how we put them in those 96 well plates? And then I showed you how we can stick that under a microscope and image them. Well, they're still moving at that time, right? And to put anything under a microscope, you need it to be still. So how do we do that one? We don't have to add an anesthesia. We don't have to add an anesthetic because we'd have to add it to each well and that would be very cumbersome. So instead, what we what people in my lab figured out was that if you take that whole dish and stick it on ice for 10 minutes on an ice bucket, the fish undergo what is called thermal anesthesia. They stop swimming. And then when you take them out, they, they stay still for exactly 10 minutes. And that's time enough to finish the whole imaging. So that's that. Okay. Now, regarding the question about my mother and, and TB, it's hard to know, you know, because of course you feel like saying it was a straight path and so on. But um, I mean, it was definitely very traumatic, you know, when you're a six year old and your mother's suddenly bedridden, you know, not once, but three times. And, um, and actually the last time, so twice ha it happened in India, but the third time we were actually, my father, my, both my parents were scientists and my father was doing a sabbatical in the US and then and we were coming back I was 12 years old and so you know this was like my my life from 6 to 12 with these relapses and we were coming back and we'd stopped in Glasgow and my mother was getting sicker and like she was getting more and more severe pain and could she could barely get off the airplane and and then we um you know, it, she got checked into the Royal Infirmary in Glasgow and they found that she had a relapse of TB. Now, my mother was slated to give a talk at some place at the university and get this, she insisted on between her diagnosis and the next surgery, which had to be done there because she was pretty unstable in her spine, insisted on going, on going and giving her talk. So she, anyway, but this time, um, you know, they put actually put a bone graft in. And furthermore, by now the new drugs had come and she actually got the, the fine, the, the newest of the lot, rifampicin on compassionate use. And that was all gotten from her. So I am a huge fan of the NHS, number one. I still remember her surgeon's names, Mr. White and Mr. Brody. Can you imagine? <laughs> I mean, it's like 50 years and I can remember their names. And when I went to Glasgow with some people for some conference, I insisted on going and seeing the Royal Infirmary and they were all wondering why this was a tourist site for me. I was like, okay, so, um, so, so there was that, but I don't know, but you know, but it wasn't like I thought then, oh God, I'm going to study TB. No, I went to medical school and then I actually did a PhD in immunology and I was actually going to go work in a virus lab. I was going to work in hepatitis B. I had already arranged everything. And then at some point, I suddenly switched over to... So before I went into infectious diseases, I was seriously thinking of becoming uh, doing hematology oncology because I was really... It's, and I still am fascinated by it. And it's clearly very important. Then I thought I'd go 
then I, I switched over. I'm, you can see I'm a very um, uh, fly, flighty, flaky person. I last minute switched over to start doing infectious diseases. Then I was going to study hepatitis B virus, went all the way to San Francisco to work in a specific lab, dragging my husband with me. And then suddenly said, no, I'm actually not going to do that. I'm going to work on TB. And I found this other lab where we, we did this weird thing. So, you know, I don't know. It probably affected me. But I also will tell you that I was completely fascinated by the biology of TB because, you know, we're also driven by the biological interest. And so for me, here was a bug with clearly important medical problems. And on top of it, the biology was interesting. And so it's, it's hard to answer these kind of questions, but that's the story. Yep. Over there. Oh, sorry. Wherever you want to go. Yeah, I was just interested in the macrophages and how the bacillus um, avoids or evades destruction. Uh, how much is known about those mechanisms? Excellent question. So actually, quite a bit is known. Much of it's come from our lab, but of course, much of it I mean, from hundreds of labs that work in it. Um, it, but but at the same time, a lot is completely unknown. And so, the, the, for example, I mean, there are you know the, probably the the bug the the macro the 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 macrophage is putting out, for example, something called reactive oxygen species, and the bug has learned to avoid this to a certain extent. Uh, but if you really pump up the reactive oxygen species. Then, then the bug will get killed. So that's one example. Nitric oxide is another mechanism. Again, the bug has got some ways to avoid it. Antimicrobial peptides are things that the bug, the macrophage puts out. So it, it, it seems like there's many things, you know, going on and how it works, we don't know. But there, we, we have some ideas that people, us and others are pursuing. Um. Just in the interest of time, um, I think we're going to have to close. But please come and ask any questions after we have time. So I just want to thank, really, I really would love to thank Lally for an amazing talk today. I think we all agree it was really outstanding. And thanks everyone for coming and also to our online audience as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>